We all know the Corvette is an icon, but what's lesser known is that icons changed once about every 10 years. So can you imagine being one of the people tasked with making that change? I certainly couldn't. So let's go behind the scenes and meet some of those people, see how they created the Corvette Stingray, and then learn how they build it. We're standing in front of a very unusual piece of hardware. This is actually the sub-assembly that's built offline that contains the engine, the transmission, the differential, most of the suspension pieces, as well as the brakes and a lot of other hardware, including electrical, and there's a big connection. There's one big piece that ties it all together. It's what we call the driveline assembly. It's actually a steel tube, and the prop shaft runs dead straight right through the center. There's a couple of rubber couplings that help isolate from vibration uh, from the engine through the rest of the vehicle. And for the C7, we actually had to triple, that means 300%, of the stiffness of the previous generation car, so we actually went from aluminum to steel. The reason we did that is to reduce noise and vibration when the engine is running in four cylinders. In four cylinder mode, the engine doesn't produce perfectly smooth torque throughout the driveline, and because of that, it sets up a vibration inside the vehicle. The other thing this thing does is react torque. When you drop the clutch on this car and the rear tires spin up, it puts a huge amount of torque into the driveline, and that has to be reacted somehow. The way we react that torque is by having a very strong member that goes all the way to the front of the car. The traction is so big back here that the whole car is trying to pop a wheelie. It's really pulling up on the engine, trying to lift the whole car up from the front. If we didn't have this part in here, the whole transmission would be reacting, trying to lift the car just with this little area right here, and that would require a huge amount of structure. As you see, there's no structure around here, and the reason is we react that torque with the engine mounts that are located all the way up here in the front of the car. Makes the whole car very uh, mass efficient, and also makes it uh, a joy to launch from rest. Bowling Green may be the home of the Corvette, but really the journey to the new Stingray began not only about 500 miles away from here, but all the way back in 1959 with visionary designers like Peter Brock and Harley Earl. Now, we can't jump into a time machine and go visit those guys, but what we can do is go to a place where we can visit Heritage and meet a guy on the Corvette team that can interpret it for us. When we wanted to do a new Corvette, one of the things that we had in mind, and the decision wasn't made at that time, this was going to be actually a Stingray. What I looked for was an overall statement, a proportion, that really relied heavily on a different way of approaching Corvette in a sculptural way. But still, when you looked at it, even without the badges, without the graphics, the form, the sculpture, the proportion, communicated an unmistakable Corvette Stingray in a new way. To me, it's a wonderful balance of very sharp edged, crisp lines with some very dramatic sculptural transitions. So it all has to work in harmony together. That's what, in my mind, uh, is the difference between styling and design, where design is that you are solving or taking on a challenge and developing a solution that is beautifully executed. And here's a good example of that, in that we know since the hood swings forward, there's hinge mechanisms in here. I wanted to make sure there was dramatic sculpture separating the fender form from the pod where the engine resides and express that beautifully on the exterior surface. Well, how do you package those components tightly in there to get the surface as low as possible to have that transition really work to the point where it's at now that really carries through the whole body. We take uh, careful consideration with uh, a digital understanding of where those components reside and then developing the surface over it. Meanwhile, back at the ranch. Look at the size of this monster. It's picking up the aluminum frame of a 2014 C7. I mean, it's like Transformers. Now, this is the important part. This whole thing, in its entirety, every computer you see, this keyboard, even this stool, was in Sterling Heights, Michigan. You see, the story goes like this. The Corvette, the C6, had a steel frame, but the Z06 and the ZR1 C6 had an aluminum frame. So here in Bowling Green, they used to make the steel frames in-house, 
but a supplier used to make the aluminum frames. Well, they decided to bring the aluminum frame construction in-house. Well, we already met Taj, he's a bit of a perfectionist, so he wanted to make sure that the process was perfect before running it live with all these systems here in Kentucky. So they went and found a warehouse in Sterling Heights, Michigan, built this entire frame assembly body shop, and then ran pilot frames and ultimately turned into the pre-production cars in Sterling Heights, Michigan. Then once they got it to the point where everything worked, even these computers down here, once it all worked and it was perfect, they boxed it all up, kind of like an erector set, put it in a truck and shipped it down here to Kentucky. Wait a minute. Why am I the one telling you guys about the intricacies of the frame of the Corvette Stingray when in the building we have the chief engineer of the Corvette Stingray? So let's let him demonstrate some of the frames, shall we say, finer details? 25 millimeter thick, so an inch thick in certain locations where the suspension attaches to the body. You want that to be like a bank ball. It wants to be just dead solid. And the previous car didn't have that at all? Not nearly as much. We use these hollow castings that uh, you can put internal ribs, so it's a shell of aluminum, and you can put internal ribs. That technology didn't exist. People didn't know how to cast aluminum. You know, you can imagine a casting an aluminum balloon. It's very hard to do a hollow casting, but that's what this is. It has an internal and an external uh, sand form that create the inside walls and the outside walls before the aluminum in, and then you actually have to shake the sand out of engineered holes in the thing and get... There's well, there's certainly more than meets the fiberglass here, but who are the people actually building it? This is a, uh, an incredible place uh, to be a part of. Uh, I've worked for General Motors for 33 years. I've been in 13 different GM locations in three countries on two continents. My whole life prior to coming to Bowling Green Assembly was building engines and transmissions. Unlike the other places I've been, no one ever came to see me in San Jose dos Campos, Brazil to watch me build engines down there or to, they never lined up outside the door when I was building transmission components in St. Catharines, Ontario, but they do here in Bowling Green. Uh, I always say that here in Bowling Green, we don't build cars, we build dreams. And our employees get that. We have over a thousand people that report to work here every day. Uh, most all of them have a GM life, much like mine, from some other location in General Motors. But everybody today says they're a Bowling Green Assembly employee. There's a few interesting things we can see here at the back of the car. One is we have much improved brake cooling. You see this very large plastic part. This takes air and routes it outboard right around the caliper into the rotor behind it, as well as to the brake lines where the fluid comes into the caliper. This is really only part of the system. There's another part of the system you don't see. It doesn't even get installed till the car's at the dealer. It's a blade that attaches to the lower control arm and it routes the air up onto this one. So it's two pieces, routes the air up, then this catches it and cools the brakes by moving the air outboard. You can't put that part on because it hangs so low to the ground you can't put the car on a car carrier with it on. So we actually put it in the trunk and the dealer installs it when it gets to the dealer. Another interesting part we have here is a supplemental uh, cooler. Um, this actually takes the transmission fluid uh, and there's actually uh, two different coolers. There's a traditional one that looks a lot like a small radiator and then we take that fluid and take it through a second cooler. This is called a she cooler. It's extremely light, weighs almost nothing. Uh, but it's very efficient in terms of cooling the uh, fluid that runs through it. This actually hangs down below the car very low, so it catches air going underneath the car. We actually have a little blade, a little deflector, that routes the air up through this bristle part, and that cools the fluid. Next week on Moto Man, part two of our behind-the-scenes journey into the 2014 Corvette Stingray, where we learn how racing influenced this production car, we take a look at build quality, and Tom, he tells us how those taillights came to pass. Okay, so here's the script. For a new Moto Man film every week, click subscribe. And to get a sneak peek of what's coming up on the show, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, Moto Man TV, all one word.